Take your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 3, if you would, please. Galatians chapter 3. We enjoyed visiting our son and his family up in Iowa. And um, sons come in handy every now and then, and mine came in handy. We got ready to um, hook our camper trailer up. We was camped out in his front yard. We got ready to hook it up. And I noticed one of the tires was flat, 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 flat. And and it naturally started pouring down rain. And I thought, oh, no, I'm going to have to change this tire in the rain. And Matthew said, I can take that by the shop and fix it. And I went, you got it. (laughs) So we pumped air into it. And he works, I would have never thought this, but he works as an auto mechanic now and does pretty good. He's already gotten several raises. He uh, was going to go and hire on at a car dealership, and his boss said, I don't want to lose you, and gave him more money. And uh, so, yeah, so... Come to find out, that was one of the first things that Matthew learned was how to fix a flat. So we put air in the tire and hooked it up and drove it over there. And sure enough, there was a screw in it. About that long. Unscrewed it and patched it and sent us on our way. So all things work together for good. Amen. Galatians chapter 3. You'll, you've heard me say this leading up to this. There are two types of religion in the world, and only two. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where you go, doesn't matter what country, what culture there is there, uh, doesn't matter what the dominant religion is there, or what, what, it, what that dominant religion is called. Um, there is going to be witchcraft in every nation in various forms, but it is still witchcraft nonetheless. We have in this world two opposing forces, God and Satan, good and evil, light and darkness. We have the supreme God who is above all gods, who does not need any assistance in this universe. He does not need any help. He does not need the aid of other gods helping him, but he employs those lesser gods, he employs us as men to aid him, but he does not need, he didn't need anybody to come and save me, but he chose to use people. In witchcraft, it seems like the devil needs his band of devils. He needs them. He is not all-powerful. He is not all-knowing. He is not all-present. He is not all-seeing. And so he must have the aid of lesser gods. We're studying Satan on Sunday night, Sunday afternoon, and we're learning about his limitations. And he does have limitations. He is not the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing. He has, he is, he is the head angel of all of the other evil angels um, in this world, in this universe. He is the head of all the bad ones. And so his religion pervades all areas of the world and it uses as its power scheme these devils, these unclean spirits, Satan and all his forces. It uses their power, their ability, uh, similar to the way we use God's power in our life. We, we look, when we want to see into the future, we have God's word to give us insight into what is going to happen. 
we're sort of studying that as well, studying the Holy Ghost on Wednesday night. The Holy Ghost gives us the power to see in the Word of God, to see God said, Jesus said He would show us things to come. Um, we have power through prayer. We have power uh, and protection around us. God will use angels to put up a shield and a defense around us. God's telling Elisha to open the eyes, or Elisha praying to God to open the eyes of his servant Gehazi so that he could see that there were more for us that were, that were there for them. And he opened his eyes, he saw chariots of fire and horses of fire. So he saw that he was encompassed about. So there is a real war going on and a battle going on every day for possession of earth, for possession of human souls. Um, it is the forces of good versus the forces of evil. And believe it or not, we know this to be true. There are people who, don't, who do not mind being on the side of evil. They think that is the powerful side. They think that is the, the strength side, the winning side, that they are going to prevail. Satan has as his goal, according to Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 13, other places, Satan has as his goal to sit upon the throne of God and to rule over God's creation. Problem is, it's God's creation. It's not his, he didn't make it, but he wants to rule over. He wants to steal, he will kill, he will destroy, and he will, he will enlist an army of not only devils, but he enlists an army of human agents to work for his side, to empower him, to enthrone him, and to bring down the forces of good, to bring down good angels. We know that Lucifer said in Isaiah 14, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will sit, I will... Um, I will ascend into heaven and exalt my throne above the stars of God. Stars are angels. So we know he wants to rule over the angelic realm. But his religion, his doctrine, his method of operation, as it were, is witchcraft. And I'll explain that. Um, I'll try to keep it simple. I have read, uh, I've read quite a few books written by witches about their craft about Wicca. Uh, the word Wicca is what they refer to their, how they refer to their religion. They call it Wicca. Wicca is an old English word that comes from the same word as where we get the word wise or wist. When Jesus said, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business. Wist means, do you know that I must be about my father's business? And so the word Wicca means that they believe they have knowledge that no one else has. They have a wisdom, a secret knowledge that no one else in the universe has. Thus, they have power over people who are more ignorant than they are, or that at least that's what they believe. The reason why I bring this up and go into such detail, Paul says, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you so we use the word bewitched here and I believe the word is the right word I believe that Paul knew what he was saying knew what he was referring to remember Paul had dealt with this as he's going from city to city preaching the gospel he has dealt with wizards he has dealt with people who use magic arts, the occult. He's dealt with people like this. He's dealt with the spirits behind people like this. And so he's not using these words lightly. He's using the word bewitched. Why is he using that word? And it really gets down to what is the difference between the two religions. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11 to be careful of anyone who wants to remove us from the simplicity that is in Christ. Okay, I was nine years old when I really felt like I needed to be saved. Now, I didn't know what an adult knows. I didn't know about God, what an adult what a, or someone who studied the Bible for years knows about God. But I knew some very simple things. I knew I was done wrong. 
I knew that God was going to hold me accountable for it because my mother and father had held me accountable for it. And I knew I was going to suffer the consequences. I was afraid of that. And when I got saved, I got saved in tears. I didn't, want to do, I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to suffer God's wrath. I couldn't say that I was in love with Jesus at the time. I probably was as, as much as a child can be, but I believed what I was being preached to. I believed what God said. And so it's that simplicity that a child can understand how to bring God in on the scene. Jesus said, suffer the little children, allow the children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, you must come to me as a little child. So it's, it's intended to be that simple. And anybody who makes Christianity or any of the doctrines we believe more complicated than that, I'd be careful of them. Or anybody who would say, well, you don't understand this because you're not on the level that I'm on spiritually. You've heard that before. You're not on my level. I'm on somewhat of a higher level than you are, so I understand it a little bit better, or I'm better at it than you are. When you come up, and I abhor that. You get me in a group of people who think they're better than me, and I'm not, I don't deal well with it. The ground's level at the cross, amen? Everybody's the same, everybody's equal. There aren't, you're, there's not somebody more saved than somebody else. Now they might know a little bit more about what's in the Bible, but the simplicity of Christ where we cry out to God, and here's the key. You can cry out to God not knowing even what to ask for, not even knowing the words to pray. Because there are no special magic words to get God's attention. If a child can bring God in on the scene, then anybody can. And that is the key right there. And I'm going to make my point in a little bit. Exodus 22, 18. This is how God sees this. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Suffer means allow. Thou shalt not allow a witch to live. God was very very much against witchcraft, sorcery, wizardry. We're going to look at a list of things that God said, I want it to never be seen among my people. Never. When you go into Canaan land, they're in there doing witchcraft. They're doing um, wizardry, necromancy. They're doing, they're doing occult practices, things that I hate. And it's for that reason that I'm casting them out of the land. Now, if I put you in that land and you end up doing what they're doing, I'll throw you out too. Even though you're my people, I'll throw you out. I won't put up with it. Nobody, nobody has the right to say because we are of a certain race or we're a certain people that we can do whatever we want to and God still has to favor us because we're this certain type of people. No one can do that. God says, I'll throw my own people out of my house. I will divorce the wife who I've betrothed. I will divorce her in a heartbeat if she will continue in this. And so God was very serious about this. Now, he used the term bewitched. So, who remembers that? Who remembers that? You remember that, Gary? Yeah. The show Bewitched. It was one of my favorite shows growing up. Okay, they used to play the reruns. Yeah, wiggle your nose. They used to play the reruns. I'd get home from school every day and watch that. Just fascinated by that. And I'm going to show you something in a little bit that kind of shows, you know, where my mind was as a boy growing up. Um, I probably, I'm not, well, I think there's kids now who probably know more about witchcraft than I do. But... This show here, there's a certain woman on here. Do you remember Aunt Clara, the character? Okay. What was so funny about her? What was she known for in this TV show? She always got... The, the, all of a sudden, there would be a goat in the middle of the living room or something. Okay. Or something messed up. One episode, Queen Victoria... Queen Victoria shows up in the Stevens house. 
from the 1800s. And she's going, oh my, oh dear. Okay, here's her problem. She didn't get the words right. She didn't say the right spell. Lisa and I were floored one time. We went up to the mall. This is when our girls were little. And we're walking past the bookstore in the mall, and right at the counter, at eye level of my daughter's, was a book, real nice, pretty pink cover, the little girl's book of spell casting. And it was written for adolescent girls, 9 to 12, 13 years old, teaching them the basics of how a child could learn the art of spell casting. Not, not a funny book, not a comic book. This was, this was real stuff, but it was meant to entice young girls. That was early 90s. Look at what's come out since then, Harry Potter. That, the book, and we actually bought a copy of it. I'm going, I'm going to buy that, and I'm going to, I'm going to research this, because I think it's dangerous. That book was probably that thick. The Harry Potter books were that thick, and you had 10, 11, 12-year-old boys and girls reading. Who reads books this thick? Kids don't, but they did. And I can tell you that J.K. Rowling, the woman who wrote the Harry Potter books, she was a down-and-out nothing, a single mom raising two or three children in England, had nothing going for her. She had never written anything in her life, and all of a sudden she's getting these stories and these ideas downloaded into her mind. Not kidding you. This stuff came out of nowhere into her thoughts and she's writing, she's trying to write it down as fast as it's coming in. She writes these books and all of a sudden it's a billion dollar industry now and the industry is continuing. It's not slowed down. Now she's writing other books, there's movies being made. Now we have Incredible Beasts and Where to Find Them and so on and so on. And it's this, open up this fantasy occult world to a generation of young people who should have been raised in Sunday school or who even may have been raised in Sunday school and turned over to witchcraft. And I have a pastor friend. He's now gone on to be with the Lord. He was a youth pastor at the time, a few years older than me. And he actually had a home missionary pastor say, have you read the Harry Potter book? Uh, isn't that witchcraft? No, there's nothing wrong with it. So this pastor friend of mine went to the library, checked it out. And he said, I read this book, I closed it, I wanted to be a wizard. I wanted to be a wizard. And he's a grown adult. What do you think this does to children? That's bewitchment. When a spell is cast or a force is laid upon you, you find yourself struggling against it. You may not understand what's going on, but you know you're struggling against things that in the flesh you have no power against them. You must call upon the name of the Lord and have God intervene in your life. Yes. Go ahead. Really? Wow. You know, when I was young you know, and drug life, you know, and it was just watching stuff like that, you know, just weird. Gary, are Ouija boards real? No. Well, they are. But they're I mean it's not it's not God speaking, it's not the dead speaking. These are devils. And my, my question is, are there forces that work with Ouija boards? And absolutely. Absolutely, no doubt in my mind. This used to be, I used to read a lot of comic books, Superman stuff, Batman, you know, innocent. But in a lot of those comic books was a full page ad for this book written by what turns out to be two very high ranking members of witchcraft in America. Gavin and I think her name was Elaine Frost and those who have been in witchcraft would know those names in America. Marketing to children like me growing up in the 70s. And if I had a buck, 
a dollar bill is all it cost. And if I knew I could get it delivered to my house without my mom finding out about it, I would have ordered it. But I'm going, mom will find it. So I didn't. I think God was just, Mike, don't do it. But there's a part here, I read, I, I read this whole thing here, one page ad in comic books. It said, so simple even a child can do it. That's not quite true. And I'll explain myself. Let's go back to Aunt Clara. Here's the thing. If you read through the Psalms, you'll see over and over, David said, I cried unto the Lord. I cried out to God, and he heard me. And he came from his holy hill, and he saved me. And you'll see that in many places in the Bible. What did he cry out? He just cried out to God. God, help me. And it really is that simple. But here's, here's witchcraft. The reason why Aunt Clara, all of a sudden, Queen Victoria from England from 1880 would show up, is she didn't say the right words. It forces you to say certain magic words in a certain order, in a certain fashion, in a ritual of some kind where you must have certain elements involved. You must draw a pentagram. You must have candles lit. You must be calling out to the four directions because that's where the four elements are earth wind fire and water and you must be doing this in a certain way at a certain date you must it must be at the equinoxes or it must be a summer solstice or winter solstice or the cross quarter days that's when the that's when the magic powers are at their best that's when the forces can work best for you and in order to get a certain thing done, you must say the certain words with a certain intention involved in that. And I even I was reading a book written by a modern witch that was basically trying to describe the language structure of the universe. And she was saying, the universe is going to aid you, but you must speak to the universe in the way that the universe can understand you. And I'm going, that's not God. That's not God. God is able to answer my prayers above what I'm able to ask or think. There is, there is not a book written by God on how to address God. There is not a book given to us. Even I mean, if you read the whole Bible, you're not going to find magic words to get God to do what you want him to do. And by the way, who said God had to do what you told him to do to begin with? Isn't God the smarter one? Aren't we the adult to our children and our grandchildren? What, are you telling me what to do? No, I'm telling you this is how it's going to be. That's how it is with God. That therein lies the difference between us and witchcraft. And witchcraft shows up then in a lot of places where it should never be. God's going to do away with it one of these days. He's going to cast all the devil forces behind witchcraft, which are real. Gary said he grew up with it. Gary, you are a miracle out of Scripture to ever escape that environment. Okay? Deuteronomy 18, turn there. Deuteronomy 18. Now, some churches will say, well, don't teach on this. You're giving the devil his due. I don't see it that way. I see it as we are not ignorant of Satan's devices and ought not be ignorant. Now, I'm not going to quote a lot of witchcraft book nonsense. I've read a lot. When we were out in Kenya, traveling with uh, Mike Hutzel, we passed by this mosque. There were two mosques in Megori town where we were evangelizing. And we drove by one of the mosques. And I noticed that, 
you know how like even in here in America when you drive down a street the buildings are lined up with the street the front of a store faces the street and the sidewalk but this mosque was turned against the street it was catty corner from the way the street and all the other buildings were lined up and I pointed that out I said do you see that and they said yeah I said do you know why that is and they said no I said well it's a Muslim mosque it had had four towers one on each corner of the building it was a square building had four towers on it and I said because you don't read books on witchcraft and I'm no, I wasn't knocking them I'm just saying I know this because I know how they think and what's behind that the idea is that that building must be oriented a certain way because when prayers are done they must be done with you facing east toward mecca you have to be doing that if you don't do that allah won't hear your prayers now go outside spin around three times and tell me which way is east on a cloudy day like this okay do we have to face God in order for him to hear us do we have to turn a certain way do we have to be facing this way do we have to do we have to pray five times a day did Daniel have to pray three times a day he prayed three times a day in front of his window did God ever tell him that he had to do that no he did it because he wanted to but he prayed no instructions here on the Bible on how many times we have to pray or how, how much limit there is to our prayers or even what we have to say. It's just we call upon the name of the Lord. For the greatest thing in the world to be saved, you call upon the, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's that simple. But witchcraft is always going to be in fact, I'll say the more ritual there is to it, the probably you're probably dealing with witchcraft some form of it even if it's a subtle form and remember the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field so subtle that they hid the letter B in the word subtle and you never knew it that's very subtle Deuteronomy 18 verse 9 when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Now underline the word abominations because that there's, there's, a, there's a spirit in charge of abominations. And her name is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She is referred to in the various passages of Scripture as the mother of whoredoms, the mistress of witchcraft. Um, in fact, if there is witchcraft involved or any of these practices, her, it is evidence that her spirit is there, not the Holy Spirit. But God calls these practices abominations. He said, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Now, we know from various historical accounts that people were taking their children, their very young children, baby children. They would hand them over to the priest. The priest would cast them upon the fire to be burned as a sacrifice to Molech, which is the devil. And I want you to think about why. Okay, we need our crops to grow this year. We got, we're going to plant and it's time to plant our seed. We're going to plant our seed. We want to make sure it rains enough and we get good crops. So Molech has asked that we all give up one child and have it cast onto the fire. And people do that. The devil makes that stuff up. Listen, he goes after little kids, does he not? Think about it. Let's see, what day is it? The 20th. We're like 11 days away from Halloween. He goes after the little kids, I'm telling you. Um, why do people get abortions? It is so that their life 
could be better. We can't have an unwanted pregnancy. If you don't want the pregnancy, you shouldn't do what causes that. But that's why people have abortion. That's why they want abortion mills to be running without any interference from government so that people can sacrifice. And there's more to it than that. I'm not going to get into it. But that's basically the same idea. We want our life to be better, so we're going to sacrifice our children for it. Some people sacrifice their children and they're never aborted. They just neglect them throughout their whole life. Somebody say amen to that. God said, Thou shalt not make thy son or thy daughter to pass through the fire. There is a, a version of that. I've mentioned this. The Bethel Church in Redding, California, and there are other places that probably do it. They'll have what's called a fire tunnel. They'll have people line up on two sides in front of the church and they'll have, they'll call that the fire tunnel and then they'll send new converts or people through this tunnel of people so they can get anointed by God in this fire tunnel. They actually call it a fire tunnel. They're making people to pass through the fire inside of a church service. Now, if God wants to anoint you, he anoints you. If God wants to bless you, he blesses you. If God wants to be nice to you, he is nice to you, even without you begging him or performing some sort of ritual. I mean, he gave you rest last night and he woke you up this morning and fed you. That's being nice. Amen? You didn't have to do anything for it. But that was number one. Number two, an observer of times. That is your astrologers, um, forecasters, monthly prognosticators, people who call to the stars and worship the stars. Worship means to serve. So they read their horoscope. Whatever the horoscope tells them, that's what they are supposed to do. And that's how they're supposed to live their life. So I'm a Gemini. So Geminis should only marry Libras or Virgos or what I don't know. But that's, that's, the stars are angels, evil angels. And they let the stars tell them what to do. The word zodiac, which is where you get the 12 constellations. The word zodiac literally means a circle of beasts or a circle of living creatures. And you're talking about beast angels that people serve because the Libra or the Sagittarius told you that you had to be this way or that your life was going to turn out this way because you were born on such and such a date and it's all a bunch of nonsense. That's an observer of times. And that goes on a lot. Especially in your churches that are oriented toward um, Hebrew roots. When you hear them talk about Yahshua and Yahuwah, and you'll, they'll never say the name Jesus. They'll never say God in those churches. More of your messianic Hebrew roots churches will be observer of times. They will say you must keep the feast days or you're not saved. Um, use the divination. Any, any form of occult divination. Tarot cards. Palmistry. Palm reading. Tea leaves. Entrails. The entrails of certain animals, I, you know, people will read the entrails or any kind of divination where you are seeking out devils or spirits to give you knowledge that you would not gain otherwise. Seances, you mentioned seances, Ouija boards, where they'll have a, a board full of letters and numbers, yes and no, usually with occult symbols on it. And they'll have the little thing on there, I don't know, the mouse or whatever it is. And people lay their hands on there and then all of a sudden now forces will move their hands. I'm not kidding. Don't mess with it. I don't care if Parker Brothers did put it out. I don't care if it is. They call it a kid's game. It's not a game. Don't mess with Ouija boards. Am I out of time? I don't think I'm out of time. I'm just getting started. But any kind of divination... Enchanter, or a, an enchanter. There's another one. Jesus told us not to use vain repetitions. 
when we pray. Do 50 Hail Marys. If you say 50 Hail Marys, God will forgive your sins. He did it's not what he said. It's the blood of Jesus that covers our sins. 50 Hail Marys is an enchanter. You are chanting out the repetition of words, thinking that through your much speaking, you will be heard. They did that when the priests of Baal were having the showdown with Elijah and the gods were supposed to send fire down to the altar. The priests of Baal began to use enchantments. They were cutting themselves. They spent most of the day trying to get Baal to send fire down from heaven. And Elijah showed up, he prayed one prayer, and God heard him. One prayer. Okay? And the Bible says that Elijah was a man of like passions as you and I. Yet he prayed one time, it didn't rain for three and a half years. He prayed one more time, and it began to rain. The sound of abundance of rain, the Bible said. It's where we get that out of our hymn book. I'll get more into this a little bit next week. But be on the lookout for witchcraft. Anything that spells of ritualism, I don't care much for it. I think you ought to be careful. Father in heaven, we seek to please you. We seek to honor you with every part of our lives. And Father, we, we are simple people who are simple-minded. And Father, the religion that you've called us into is a sim simple religion. It is not complicated. It is that you loved us and did for us what we were not capable of doing. It's that simple. And Father, help us to warn others not to be drawn away from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Help us, dear God, to never be bewitched by the vain talkers, by the babblings. Help us to never be lured away from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Bless your word. Bless your people today. We love you and we thank you for gathering us here in this place. Prepare us for days to come. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.